Thanks to those of you who've showed up already. We're going to get started in a few minutes, just giving some time in case folks show up late. Yeah, I think you can start, Andy. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this editorial open house. Uh, you'll be hearing from a few folks in the editorial leadership, as well as our CEO for the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance. Uh, we're excited to have you here and glad that you're interested in this opportunity. And we're here just to tell you a little bit about the journal, the opportunity, and answer any questions you might have. To get us started, uh, Adriana Bankston, our uh, CEO, will tell you a little bit about herself and about uh, her work at the journal. All right. Well, um, thanks so much for being here today. Sorry, I'm trying to switch the view here so I can see my video. Okay. Um, so I'm currently the CEO for the journal. Um, I've been involved with JSPG since about 2018 in a number of roles, um, working on communications and outreach. Uh, more outreach for another year and then uh, now been the CEO for the past couple of years. Um, it's been a great experience and hopefully you all uh, will benefit um, from hearing from our editorial team today, uh, which is a big part of um, what we do. But essentially my role is to um, think more strategically about how we can empower and activate uh, the world's uh, next generation policy fellows and, and decision makers, folks who are in, uh, you know, transition now or in training and will become the leaders in the field. Um, that involves a lot of research, writing and engaging different partners, as you've seen probably our special issues, uh, as well as uh, outreach for, with the standard issues. And um, there's a lot of partnership development involved, um, as well as strategic um, um, development through with the governing board and uh, overseeing all of the um, staff, uh, the editorial process, and um, as well as operations and fundraising. So if you have any questions broadly about the journal and how we work um, through the editorial team and, and more broadly, happy to answer those. Um, what I'll say is sort of what I um, see as benefits working with JSPG are uh, really for a lot of folks, it's been a stepping stone into the field, um, as you'll hear from the editors today, um, to be able to gain skills in research, writing, and editing policy, uh, a lot of folks who published the journal went on and did big things in the field. So it's I think it's a it's a good stepping stone for a lot of folks who are transitioning. Um, through the editorial um, process, you can also learn about um, the global policy landscape. As you know, we have a lot of international partners and um, it's a good opportunity to see what's happening in the field, uh, different scales. Um, and of course, contributing to the policy community, participating in events, you're welcome to to join. And we've we've worked more on this um, in the past few years to try to facilitate some interactions and networking among editors as well as training. So that's something likely to uh, continue as well that you can take advantage of. And uh, I think it's a really helpful um opportunity for professional development as well and give you some visibility as editors um, as you transition into policy. So that's it for me. I'll turn it back to Andy now. 
Thanks, Adriana. Uh, that gives us a good overview of what you do at the top and some of the big things folks can expect from JSPG. Uh, for the next set of the presentation, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the journal, but I'd like to just give you a few key details to make sure you uh, get a sense of our mission and how that informs what the associate editor role is like. So JSPG, uh, as you may know, is an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed research publication. Uh, we're over a decade in operation and we're, uh, we sit in a very nice sweet spot where we're really helping early career researchers write about the intersection of science and policy. There's some journals where, for more established uh, professionals and there are some journals who similarly help early career researchers but don't have our length and history of time uh, as well as our peer review process. So I think we really fulfill a unique uh, need within the science policy sphere we provide a platform to connect policy organizations and promote issues that uh, our writers care about, that our editors care about, and that all of our leadership is uh, passionate about and interested in. And finally, it's just an opportunity to encourage researchers to engage with the policymaking process. I think, as a lot of you may have experienced firsthand, it can be a little bit frustrating just being at the bench and not seeing the fruits of all the scientific information that we might have. And it gives a real opportunity to engage with all the, how, how these ideas can inform the policymaking process. Altogether, JSPD publishes research-based articles that concern every corner of science and technology policy. So to give you a sense of what that looks like on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, we publish anywhere from four to six issues a year. Two of those will be standard calls, which are open for submissions of all, uh, any topic, any format. Uh, so that really allows us to hear um, from a wide range of topics for the, uh, for the year. Uh, but we also have two to four special issues every year, and those will be in partnership with a uh, major organization. In the past, this has been you know, Sigma Chi, uh, the University College London, uh, UNESCO. Uh, we're increasingly looking for international collaborations there. And as you can see in our publications from 2022, where we had five publications, uh, we had some major uh, partners as well as a diverse range of topics. So you can see that we touched on STEM education and workforce development, uh, science diplomacy, and uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so there's really quite a lot that we end up talking about in our specific issues. Uh, right now, we're uh, we have an open call, our standard uh, summer standard issue, which will uh, excuse me, our winter standard issue, which will close in late November. We also have a special call, the Civic Science for Transformative Policy Solutions to Societal Challenges, that wraps up in October, and. Uh, you won't have a chance to work on the civic science issue as applicants in this cycle, but you would have a chance in the winter standard issue, as well as all the articles in 2024. So a bit about what that looks like. The associate editor job posting, it's a professional development opportunity. It's part-time volunteer, and it's a one-year expected term minimum. Uh, there's an opportunity to renew afterwards if you're still interested, if it's been a good fit and we're satisfied with your work. Uh, the commitment is quite low. It varies throughout the year. Uh, we put it at one to three hours per week, but in some weeks it's uh, no uh, no real work other than a couple of emails maybe. And uh, other weeks it'll be a little bit more uh, in depth. Our associate editors who are here on the call with us uh, will be able to tell you more about that firsthand experience. Uh, it's a wide range of eligibility. I've had a few questions about this uh, via email. You just have to fulfill one of these eligibility categories so you can be a grad student, a postdoc fellow, a, a science policy fellow, or just in general, an early career professional. So that's within a few years of your PhD. We're perfectly fine with that. Uh, we like to see you in that role for a minute. We're not, it's really, we're trying to assist early career professionals more so than established professionals. So if you're someone who's right next to tenure, we don't think JSPG is a good fit for you as an associate editor, but there might be other opportunities for you to get involved and we'd be happy to talk with you about that in more detail. And a big thing that we're really committed to is expanding our network and our communication. So this is really a global call. Uh, more and more we're hiring editors from across the globe. Uh, with a major em emphasis on the diversity of our editorial board. We ex hope that you'll have some familiarity or experience or interest in science policy, but that is certainly not uh, officially required, nor is prior editing experience. The big thing that we want to see is commitment to these issues and an interest in these issues. So as you fill out the application form, you'll see that you mention your areas of research and po a policy interest. Uh, but a real key focus of what we hone in on is the writing sample 
in your article analysis. Here, are you showing both a clarity of communication and an interest in editing uh, and the policy content that really uh, fits with the journal's mission? And to get a sense of what uh, a JSPG publication looks like, just go ahead and go to our website. You can find a range of different topics, and that'll give you a feel for the different kinds of questions uh, we might look for. Uh, so to give you a rough idea of the uh, editorial application timeline, uh, so we are in early September now. So we are going to, the excuse me, the call for applications closes in late September. Uh, you would expect to hear back from us in early November. Uh, we'll be conducting interviews after we screen all the publications. I will be conducting the interviews. Uh, and then once you're onboarded, uh, excuse me, once you're accepted, you'll be have uh, a light onboarding process and then we'll, uh, as well as some training. And then we'll get you started editing as soon as possible, as soon as works for your schedule and lines up with our issues and needs. So to give you a sense of how, uh, you know, that's a rough overview of the process, but I'll give you a sense more of how the editorial board works and thinks in general. Uh, so we'll start with myself. I'm Andy Sanchez. I'm the editor in chief for the journal, as I mentioned before. Uh, I, in my own work, I'm a senior researcher at the Sustainable Media Lab in The Hague in the Netherlands. It's a position I've held for a year. Uh, I have my PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering from Cornell, and as well as an MFA in creative writing from NYU. I've been the editor-in-chief since the spring. Before that, I was the assistant editor-in-chief of special editions, and before that, an associate editor. So in all my time at the journal, I've always been on the editorial side, so I've seen definitely all the different things that we prioritize in our editorial capacity. And I'm happy to provide uh, answers to any questions you might have on that front. My role as the editor in chief, uh, I help steer the mission of the journal and the strategy in partnership with our CEO. And I'm in charge at the top level of all the edit editorial activity at JSPG. So that involves uh, managing the assistant editors in chief, one of whom is on the call with us today. Uh, as they support the other associate editors who do the ground level editing really on right on the front of each piece. Additionally, I uh, solicit and develop professional development opportunities for all of the editorial book board. So if you join, that'll include you, but it also includes our uh, assistant editors in chief, trying to provide lots of opportunities for you to leverage this position into something that can gain you more skills, more exposure, whatever you might need. And of course, I'm also in charge of interviewing the prospective associate editors. So if you choose to finish an application, uh, I'll be the one who reviews it and interviews you uh, this fall. In terms of what I think working at JSPG is good for, what it gives you, uh, the first thing, of course, is to deepen your science policy expertise. If you're really passionate about an issue, learning more about that issue and thinking harder about it uh, is something that you'll naturally develop in the editorial process, where you really get into the finer details of any piece you're working on. However, it's gotta be said that you're gonna translate those skills, be they scientific or policy, to areas outside your expertise. So you're gonna develop a really complex and adaptive skill set. because in any editorial uh, situation, we're not necessarily expecting you only to focus on your expertise. You might end up editing articles on a variety of topics. And so in that way, I think you're gonna really uh, get a full understanding of how you can reach a variety of audiences and really understand how uh, the science and policy are affected in a given issue. In general, you're going to improve your understanding of uh, address reaching a broad audience and how in particular that's different from academic writing. And I think you'll gain a lot of skill in honing those kinds of uh, reaching those kinds of audiences. And finally, it's a really marketable skill set of editing and communication. Uh, you're Probably a lot of you are working on uh, PhDs or you're deep in, uh, you might be deep into science and working at JSPG, I think gives you a lot of opportunity to talk about how you've thought about uh, science policy documents and how you've thought about issues from a variety of angles, uh, which I can talk about in a little more detail here. So this is sort of what you'll learn to look for as a JSPG editor. Uh, my colleague, will, uh, Connor, will talk a little bit more about the process, but as you go through it, you're going to start becoming more and more attuned to evaluating articles in these three areas. So first, within, in terms of topic, you're going to be able to uh, understand if a problem is clearly identified, if the audience is. You're going to be able to get a better sense of whether ideas are novel, even in a field you might not be familiar with. You'll be able to become comfortable doing uh, a light bit of research to get a sense of how a new proposal fits within that field. And certainly for special issues, 
uh, you'll be see if uh, an art given article is clearly focused on the special topic. As for their argument, you'll get a sense of uh, what's a good and robust amount of references. Uh, you know, we don't have a set maximum or minimum, but you'll get a sense of what is a well-researched piece. Uh, in additional addition, you'll also get a good sense of who's using what kinds of sources. Uh, sometimes we get submissions that are really uh, filled with press releases, and we want our authors to go to the orig original source, to go to the academic studies when that's possible. You'll also get really good, uh, I think this is a key skill that editors have to provide to the authors, at helping them focus that argument, understanding how the introduction and the background need to stick to relevant inf info that sets up the whole argument. There's so much you can talk about in the introduction and background for any science issue and for any policy issue, and in particular, any combination of those two topics. And so it's really important for your authors and for you as an editor to be able to identify what's useful, what's gonna get an audience's attention and help set up this general proposal. Uh, and how, how is it gonna flow smoothly and make logical transitions as well? And finally, you'll spend a lot of time thinking about their recommendations. Are they specific? Do they evaluate pros and cons? Do they consider obstacles and responses from key stakeholders? I think this part more than anything is what will you'll learn to apply no matter the topic and that you can really take away from being uh, an editor at JSPG is this ability to understand how these arguments are functioning and how uh, these consequences might affect, affect different stakeholders, even if it's not your area of expertise. So that's a good sense, I think, of skills that you'll learn to be able to identify as a JSPG editor. But Connor, my uh, colleague, the assistant editor in chief, will talk a little bit more about uh, the editorial process and his experience with the journal. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'm Connor Filson. I'm uh, the assistant at one of the three assistant editor in chiefs at JSPG. Uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate in ecology and evolution at UCLA, but jumping over to do basically the same thing just across the pond in England uh, in a few months. But I was first an associate editor, like like Andy was uh, as well. And then I moved into the assistant editor in chief role uh, a couple of months ago. So my role in the overall editorial process that we're going through here in just a second is essentially to take the articles from beginning to end and kind of manage up towards Andy and the CEO and manage down towards the AEs and just make sure everybody's on the same page and, and we're moving along at uh, a pace and an efficient pace because I really think that's one of the things we want to maximize here is what we're all learning and all of our time because this is most certainly not the only thing that all of us do. Um, for the associate editors, and I'll let uh, the two associate editors that are here describe that a little bit more, but their your general duties are to work with a partner uh, to edit. Uh, usually, I would say like four articles a year, but it's, if you're assigned to an issue, it's usually two. You're a primary on one uh, and like the secondary on another. And you walk that through once we get through the initial kind of desk review and, and, and review process to say, yes, we think we're going to accept these pending. We go through this, this long revision process uh, and the editors improve and the authors improve their, their articles. So you help walk through that. You provide a lot of uh, comments in there, a lot of changes. You're, you're, you're helping them think critically about their piece and their narrative and their recommendations and bringing them from uh, a place where maybe they've never written to a place where this is actually a usable piece of, of science policy. Um, I think other important things as an AE is timely communication. I'll go through the timeline in just a second, but you see it kind of goes from like a bump up work for two weeks and then quiet for two weeks. So it's kind of like a weird regiment of trying to be uh, on time and getting things done to kind of getting to forget about it for, for a few days. Uh, but really, I think it's an opportunity to like hammer home all of the skills that you're gaining in a PhD or a master's program or whatever it is that you do to bolster your critical thinking, not just in how you think about things, but how you present them and recommend them to people who might not have the same incentive structures uh, as the background you're coming from. Uh, collaborative problem solving, I think that's a big thing at the journals. We're all working together. And I really, I think that's probably the thing I enjoy the most is, is bouncing ideas off of everybody else uh, and learning how other people think. Um, Exposure to new ideas because I am I am an ecologist. I study animal behavior that has almost no implications for policy. So most of the things I do are exposure to new ideas, which I really uh, enjoy and I think is a big draw to the journal. All of this leads to a great science policy peer network uh, and exposes you, of course, to the editorial process. 
Um, so in the next slide, I have what is going to seem like overwhelming, but we're going to break this down into two parts. So in the next slide, we'll just look at the general process. Um, and so this goes from desk review, which is when basically there's a deadline, the authors submit, the CEO, the editor-in-chief, and an assistant editor-in-chief sit down really quick and give them all a read and say, yes, this is a fit, especially for the special issues, asking if this is the right topic for that special issue, or if we need to flat out reject it or bump it maybe to a standard issue if it doesn't fit, um, if it's a special issue. After we take, we downsample that by just a few, we go to the uh, associate editor review, which is when you as an associate editor would be assigned five articles to give kind of a quick high level read and rate them on a variety of scales like readability or their clear recommendations is the audience they're speaking to clearly identified. And then from that, after everybody ranks, so every article gets multiple associate editors looking at it, we rank those and determine uh, what we're going to accept, what we may reject, what may get bumped to a standard issue. Um, from there, we then enter the editing stages. So there's two rounds of editing, and those are broken up into two segments each. So the, in editing stage one, uh, in part of that, when you're reviewing those all those articles, you can kind of be like, oh, I'm interested in editing this one. I'm not interested in that topic at all. Oh, I have some expertise in this. So we try to get you assigned your, your two articles for the editing. We try to get you assigned to articles that you may be interested in or more capable in based on your background. Um, so you then have two weeks to, to provide edits to try to make the message clearer, make it a better fit for the journal. And then it goes back to the author for two weeks. The authors then send it back. We then do a high level review, which is again going to be the CEO, the editor in chief, and an assistant editor in chief, uh, who will give in just a week these really high level, kind of like broad, broad questions we'll leave on there. Be like, why, why is this the message? Let's break this down a little bit more. We'll then go into the second round of editing, where you, as the associate editor, provide another round of comments. Usually these are to clean it up a little bit more, not the, the really big. Uh, time-consuming edits of maybe the first round, goes back to the authors for another two weeks. And then when it comes back, we ensure that the authors have made all the relevant edits. We don't want authors skipping out on... on th it, it's great to have dialogue and, and, and pushback, but we don't want people to just completely ignore um, comments, and we want to have conversations if they do. So that's where we double-check all that right at the end, and then we format them, copy edit them, and then that reads into... Uh, the publication. So on that next slide, you'll see we'll bring back the overwhelming. This is kind of what the general timeline for you as an associate editor would be, is in that initial review, you'd have two weeks to read four or five articles at a high level and rate them on those variety of scales. Uh, I'm hoping that our associate editors here can correct me if I'm getting these times wrong, but I think that's over the two weeks, probably three or four hours of work um, to, to rate all those articles. You then have like two weeks off. Why the editorial leadership figures, incorporates all those uh, values and ranks all the articles and determines what we're going to accept or not. And then we go into, act, into that editing stage. And so again, that's a four week block, but only two of those weeks are you kind of on. And this one's uh, a little bit of the, those, that first round's a little heavier. So it's probably five hours over that, over that two weeks. And then you send it back to the authors who have it for two weeks and they make all the revisions. So you're kind of then off-ish for two weeks, unless their authors are emailing you to ask a clarifying question. Then we go into the high-level review, uh, which is when the CEO and, and editor-in-chief and everybody take a look. So you're you're off for a little bit there. And then we come back uh, into that editing stage. So the authors will have revised based on your last round of edits. And then there's a round of high-level edits from the editorial leadership that you then add more edits to. We send back to the author Right, so you have two weeks. It's usually a little less work here, I think. It's so probably like three hours. Then you have two weeks off while the authors look at it again. And then it will come back one final time. We'll all make sure we get the grammar right, the spelling right, all the changes that have been made. We'll format it uh, into the template for the JSPG article look. And then that's pretty much it. So it's a decently long process from start to end, but you're not on 24 7 right? This is, this is very... Uh, broken up into you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, um, which 
is kind of nice because I always find when I take a few weeks off and then come back to the same article, I have more ideas on on how we can help the authors through. Um, so we can answer questions on this at the end. Um, but one of the additional things as an associate editor, you might get asked if you're available to do things like present today. And luckily we have two of our incredible associate editors here uh, to talk a little bit about their journey. So first let me welcome Abby to talk about their experience and then we'll hand it over to Diane to talk about their experience. Great, thanks Connor. Um, yeah, I'll try and say what hasn't already been said, um, but I am currently an ORISE postdoctoral fellow um, at the USDA Agricultural Research Service in beautiful Beltsville, Maryland. Um, and my background is in food science. Um, I graduated about a year ago. Um, and I started at JSPG kind of toward the end of the third year of my PhD, which I think that's the time when you're getting really specific into your project. So it helped to kind of have a, you know, zoom out big picture uh, look at the world of science and policy and not get so bogged down in kind of the difficult phases of uh, your PhD research. So anecdotally, it's kind of a reality check um, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, and as far as the role, Connor explained really well where we fit in. We help with that initial screening. Um, but the main part is communicating directly with the authors, making sure that we are on the same page as them and providing them all the information they need to, um, you know, format their citations correctly and make sure that the content and flow works. Um, and you're never doing this alone. So you have another editor to kind of um, check you, make sure that you both understand the, the paper and things like that. So you're communicating with a few different people in the process, but um, it's pretty drawn out and you're never usually rushed to get any of this done. And I, I think editors kind of support each other also as things, things come up, things happen, we're all busy. Um, so that gives kind of an additional layer of flexibility to the editorial process. Um, and as far as benefits of working um, with the journal, I think a lot of them have been said already, my main draw was just being exposed to science policy topics beyond my area of expertise and just kind of better understand where my work fits in in the bigger world of, of science and technology policy. Um, and I think that network is a really big draw to the journal as well, just meeting um, new people in similar or totally different areas. Um, and the science policy community is growing, but it's still small. And I think people tend to reach out and help each other. Um, and you'll see a lot of familiar names and faces, which is great, um, especially in the last few years of some kind of distance and uh, isolation. Um, and I will say that it is a small time commitment, but it can have a really significant impact on your personal and professional growth. Um, and really gives you an appreciation for that editorial process too, maybe if you have a couple um, articles in submission right now uh, for your own work. Um, and as far as me, I'm personally really interested in food, nutrition, and agriculture policy, but also policy for those innovation systems and how we can, um, you know, better improve the way that we're doing agricultural research um, in the context of a lot of the complex issues we have. So that's kind of my corner of the world. I've put my info here if you want to add me on LinkedIn and ask any other questions about um, JSPG or anything else. So thanks. Hey everyone, my name is Diane. I'm a chemistry PhD candidate at Emory University in Atlanta. And I started working at JSPG um, the end of my fourth year of my PhD. So uh, I'm interested not only in bioorganic chemistry, but watching my peers go through our PhD program. I had a lot of conversations about who is here in the program learning about science, who is favored in the system or disfavored, um, and who in the general public is learning about the things that we are researching and can have a conversation about messenger RNA the way I can as a, as a chemical biologist. So I am interested in science policy because I don't want to be just sitting at my bench collecting data 
putting it into an article, rinse and repeat. I want uh, the rest of our population, like the US and globally, to be able to understand what we're doing, why it's important, and how to implement the findings that we're collecting and the conclusions that we're drawing to improve our society. So that was why I was drawn to JSPG. Um, I am really grateful for the opportunity I've had to explore a career avenue outside of academia or industry that most people around me have been going into. I've gotten to see what science policy work is like, get a taste for it. I've always enjoyed editing and I help a lot of my peers in my program with their presentations and preparations for um, qualifying exams or writing manuscripts or grants. So it's a way to kind of help hone and polish other people's writing. And something that's uh, really amazing, I think, is the ability to interact not only with different science policy um, members like those on this call and other editors at JSPG, but people in the US and around the world thinking about these issues that have never crossed my mind before. So the first two issues that I worked on were last summer. One of them was uh, in the standard issue and one of them was in the open science special topics issue. And I remember of those four, some of the most memorable articles I worked on were one discussing how to make um, STEM museums more engaging for diverse populations. Another was developing agrivoltaics in Indiana. And then for the open science issue, it was authors from both India and Nigeria talking about how to um, expand digital, uh, expand and elaborate upon digital infrastructure in their countries and how those processes uh, were similar and different. So I've learned a lot and kind of, like uh, Abby said, gained more global awareness. Um, and so I think you've already heard about what the associate editor position is like for the most part. I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn if anyone wants to talk after this call. But um, I figured I'd share some tips on how to be more competitive as an applicant. So I actually applied for the first time at the end of my third year of my PhD, and I didn't get it. So you can be like me, it might take two tries, but it's a great experience. Uh, so the first time I talked about some of my science policy experience outside of um, JSPG, that had involved mostly at the time working with a student group in my department. So that's accessible to probably almost anyone on this call just what kind of happenings are going, what kind of happenings are there in your local environment? How can you be developing policies to help the people immediately around you? Um, from there, I wound up like reaching, from there, you can kind of use that as a stepping stone to achieve a broader impact and start going, you know, maybe to your university level or maybe local statewide uh, experiences you can have. That helped me be more competitive as an applicant. I also asked the um, editor in chief at the time what could make my application stronger. And he gave me some feedback, which I then incorporated into my cover letter the following year. That was good. <laughs> um, and you can also ask others in this space for application feedback, reach out to JSPG staff, and then kind of think about are you interested in being an author on one of our publications? Or if you'd rather be an editor, what is it about that difference that draws you? Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks so much to Diane and Abby and to Connor. Uh, I'm sure our guests appreciated hearing your insights. Uh, now we're gonna open it up to questions. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And yeah. Um, we're happy to take any and all questions that you might have. You know, that was a lot of information, uh, whether it's about the journal, the position, the application process, or our particular paths in science policy, because I think uh, we've each had some interesting experiences. We'd be happy to talk about whatever's interesting to you. So please feel free to drop a, a line in the chat or to just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. I think we're a small enough group that we can just do it that way. <laughs> And yeah, I'm curious about your experience getting the MFA. Did that come before the PhD? Or after? <laughs> that was before the PhD. Yeah, I had finished my, uh, I was finishing my bachelor's and applied to 
an MFA and PhD programs, and I was lucky enough to get into the MFA, and uh, Cornell was kind enough to defer my offer for two years, so I did that, and it was a great experience, and I think it's actually a big part of why I wound up doing science policy work, because a lot of the conversations we would have in an MFA, for those who don't know, an MFA is a Master of Fine Arts. It's a two-year, it's a one to two-year, my is a two-year uh, degree where you just focus on writing, so that might be the uh, craft of crafting fiction or poetry, uh, as well as producing a lot of original work. A lot of the conversations you end up having in those uh, classes and in those communities is about how individuals navigate institutions and how uh, they deal with those challenges, which I think is actually quite similar to what science policy wants to do. It thinks about how science can inform these institutions and how an individual uh, or we as a society aren't using knowledge to uh, grapple with all these different challenges. Um, and so I, I think it was informative for me, both on a writing standpoint, but also exciting way to uh, just think differently about the world. I would encourage it to anyone who's interested in it. It's a, uh, made a lot of very dear and close friends. Thank you for that question. Of course. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll go again. <laughs> it's fun. Please. So as an associate editor, how do you know when you feel like qualified to to edit on a specific topic or or write on a specific topic? Or as a writer too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I might hand that off to the current associate editors to see how they, they've been feeling about it. I have some opinions about it, but it's been a couple of years since I was an associate editor. I think you would be surprised like how your technical expertise in your area can translate to these topics. So um, that has been something I, you know, you might not understand exactly what a certain concept is, but you can see how it fits into the argument that the authors are trying to make. Um, and so we're not necessarily here to be you know, the expert, you know, vetting their work on <laughs> the technical side. But I think that you are more qualified to do that than you think. I mean, there are certain things that are way outside of your area or that you're just straight up not interested in. Um, and you voice that usually beforehand in the process. So I don't think you end up getting um, assigned to something that you're completely incapable of dealing with. Yeah, to That's elaborate, good. when I had the agrivoltaics in Indiana paper on my desk, I felt way over my head. I know absolutely nothing about this, but um, kind of like you'll experience in the lab, you have to do a new experiment. No one in your lab has done it before. It's your job to go do a deep literature dive and gain a bit of general understanding. And then I think like Connor said earlier, um, this is more about looking kind of scrutinizing how an article an, an argument is laid out and how the pieces are fitting together and that's some knowledge that you need for probably anything that you'll write during your entire career and so figuring out you know even though I don't understand I, I don't have that much background knowledge um, like what is it about this argument that is making it stronger what's missing what am I as a non-expert wondering um, that's what most of the readers will be too uh, and I think it helps you hone your writing skills and you can take that anywhere beyond in your career as well. Just to amplify a point that Diane made, um, if it's a, an effective article, it should be written in a way where anyone understands what's useful in the science and what the policy impact is. And so as an editor, part of your job is making sure that that is clear. And so that might require, as Diane mentioned, uh, doing some original research, but it should also just be part of a lot of question asking, just why don't I understand something here? What's missing in this information? And I think uh, your expertise as a scientist is very good preparation to just to be able to do that uh, level of interrogation. And I think uh, what we found pretty much consistently is that our associate editors are quite capable and quite confident uh, in doing a great job in editing these pieces. But that concern is very common amongst applicants. So don't feel alone. <laughs> Awesome. 
Yeah, please. Hello, I'm joining you from Ottawa, Canada. So um, I've recently published uh, in the journal, so wonderful experience. I want to learn a little bit about the, the cost of running this kind of journal. I didn't see any uh, article processing fee or any other ways of managing all the expenses. That's the first question. Secondly, in relation to that, I see on the website, uh, the staff members, they are different. Are they different from the editorial team in terms of like their staff members are directors for communication or engagement, outreach? How do they work closely or how do they work with the editorial aspects? Yes, that's for me. <laughs> okay. Um, first question, yes, we don't charge the authors, uh, because as you've seen, a lot of them are grad students and, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we, you know, we value that we're not, we're not going to charge grad students to publish. Um, the model is basically most of the funding right now comes from our sponsors, uh, which is sufficient to cover the expenses that we have, which is not, um, it's not a lot. We have, you know, a website, Zoom, we do events and we do, um, you know, registrations for conferences, that sort of thing. So it's not a huge expense right now. Um, we, I would say like, even have, you know, have some reserves from the issues that we've published. So that's kind of where it comes from to kind of maintain the operations and, and cover other things we need. Um, and then for the staff, I think as Andy kind of alluded to this, so we um, sit down and review sort of high level all the articles that come in for each of the issues before they go to the editors, uh, just in case there's things that, you know, don't fit or we've already published one or it's not particularly novel, you know, it's it's kind of high level things that we um, eliminate or, or discuss just before we um, send to the editors for more in depth. Um, Everyone else, um, and so I think that's worth pointing out to that um, there are other aspects to the journal that support the publications, right? So all the staff, um, you know, work on outreach, communication, social media, newsletter. Uh, you know, we try to pitch um, publications to media outlets. Um, we submit sessions to conferences, that sort of thing, to get the authors to speak. And so we've done a lot of that virtually during COVID. You know, we've been successful in having authors speak on their publications in different ways. Um, and then we have a director of podcasts um, as well. So all of these things are around, um, you know, supporting published work in all these different ways. And so the staff work closely with um, uh, the editorial team once the, the issues are out or sometimes before, even before publication to try and highlight and things and um, so we are, I, I would say, um, strategically, folks who are on staff have a, some experience in policy. So we're sort of, uh, you know, made to have some connections or be able to network or that sort of thing. So, um, you know, we're a few years into the field in some ways that we have some um, expertise and network that we may be able to help with. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. I'm, I might add just a couple more details about how the editorial side runs. That just might be interesting to you. Uh, so typically um, within the editorial side, we promote from within. So applying to be an associate editor is the way to be, eventually become an assistant editor in chief like Connor is an editor in chief like I am. Uh, I had all three of those roles. Connor was previously an associate editor. Uh, it's a volunteer position. So we're really working uh, on our own time. And as a journal, we try to respect everyone's time and make sure that, you know, communication is timely and that we're all working hard, but that we're adaptive to different schedules and that we're uh, not asking too much for you. So that's why you've got a partner with everything you do. And that's also why we have staff that helps with some of the more outreach things associated with a final publication. Uh, as Adriana's description might have demonstrated to you, a lot of that is really focused on the authors and their publications. We do now have some things to assist associate editors in particular if they're interested in professional development opportunities. That's something we as a journal are uh, trying to do more and more. Uh, and I expect, especially if you join in this cycle, that we're going to be doing more uh, in the coming year and a half on that front. Um, what that looks like uh, is, is still open up to a matter of uh, you know, we're, we're still addressing. I think that we're gonna have a, an open house with associate editors soon to sort of get their opinion of 
what they want to do. And we try to have a flat structure like that pretty frequently where you can ask for things that you need, whether that's support on an article or that's uh, a professional development opportunity for us to try to set up. Uh, we try to assist in any way we can. Thank you. I might have another question, but I'll wait. And uh, I recognize your name, and it's uh, it's great to see uh, previous authors uh, applying for the uh, the journal. That's that's definitely uh, happened a few times. I, I see another uh, previous author as well. Uh, thanks so much for your interest, and uh, we we would love to be a home for your editing. Now that we've been a home for your writing. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I, yeah, go ahead. No more questions. So I'll ask, uh, how do you find reviewers? The thing is, I've seen lots of journals. I've interacted with lots of people across several countries many times. To find a willing reviewer or an active reviewer is hard. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one major factor in running a journal. Uh, and I would like to learn more because unless this um, review cycle is circulated through some like structure, it might be difficult given specific types of topics might come in where none of the AEs might have any expertise. And yeah. in that, do we get to see like senior scientists reviewing for our journal? So that's typically we, we handle all the editorial capacity within our editorial board. So our associate editors and our um, assistant editors in chief are handling all that activity. When you, we do the initial screening, you'll, as Connor mentioned, uh, you'll get five or six articles and you can note, I really have no expertise or interest in this article. Please do not assign it to me. And uh, as best as we can, we take that into consideration. And between five and six on a given piece, uh, on a given topic, excuse me, on a given issue, uh, you'll find something that's enough of a fit or whether it's an interest or expertise that we haven't really had a problem with that historically. Um, and we are quite adaptive. We have uh, an, an editorial team the numbers in the 30s uh, or 30s or 40s. So over the course of a year, um, you don't, you're not involved in every issue. So between your availability and your interest, we try to keep those things in common, uh, in, in check when we're trying to decide uh, who gets to be assigned to what. Um, we do have external reviewers for competitions. That's a different matter. Uh, but that's not something that you would be involved with as an associate editor, where you would have to rank something in comparison to another uh, to determine uh, a cash value price. Connor, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, again, this is a big peer network, and I think we all bounce ideas off of each other. So when I reach a point even as the assistant editor-in-chief where i'm like i'm not completely sure on this one thing i go and i seek out uh another editor who i know has that expertise um and 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 bounce ideas off of them and, and i think like diane said is we read it extensively when you're when you're editing these things so you almost when i'm asked to review other papers for like science journals and my other day job uh i don't maybe sit down and read as comprehensively as i do when i'm editing editing here um, so it's a slightly different structure, um, but I think it's potentially more rigorous. Yeah, I think one thing just to add to the peer peer network, because that's really helpful. I think if you don't have expertise on something, but another editor might, uh, that's helpful to get to them and discuss. Um, and just to touch, touch upon the external review process. So that is sort of um, an additional layer to what's being accepted um to where you know experts review specific topics so for instance we're about to publish an issue on um, national security next week um you know those folks are really experts that know the topic and so they've selected one um outstanding article from that and so they review all of them you know score and give uh responses and um it's very rigorous in that sense and that if you win you know that's another honor uh, in addition to publishing. So um, those folks can also be helpful if you're interested in the topic, because um, we do list their names on the website. And, you know, if you want to connect with them, that's an option too. But that's sort of the next, le next level. 
be out bad that um where we have competitions and there's different um incentives for that or or rewards some of them have been cash prizes um sometimes it's um you know, writing in blogs from our partners, you know, some of them have a podcast. And so they have opportunities to highlight the winners in different ways. Um, sometimes it's conferences where, you know, we've had one author um, talk to some of the staff at UNESCO because she was focusing on open science in Ukraine and they were interested in that topic. So they actually used her expertise and, um, you know, for a UNESCO report, basically, which is also pretty unique. So um uh, yeah there's there's things that um i think you can gain if you're if you win the competition too additional things any other questions i think luis you still had one maybe so uh do you guys have the same application cycle like every year like we recruit again in the fall next year. Yeah, actually we have two application cycles per year. So uh, we'll have this one again in the fall for sure, but we'll also have another one in the spring most likely. Nice, okay, thanks. And uh, a quick point uh, related to that, um, we don't allow editors to publish in the journal. So if you're interested in publishing with us and you haven't already, you might consider uh, trying to publish now or in the next uh, run of issues and then applying. Um, if you're in, and if you've already submitted something for this issue, uh, we can manage that and see where you are in the process and go from there. But typically, we uh, editors are not allowed to publish. Well, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please feel free to email us. All of our addresses uh, are on the website, uh, and please feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn or on Twitter or whatever social media you prefer. Uh, follow JSPG to learn more about this opportunity and future events and workshops, uh, which you can participate in, whether you become an editor or not. And at, ultimately, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we hope that JSPG can help you with whatever science policy interest you have next. And thanks as well to Abby, Diane, and Connor for participating uh, in this. And yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for your time and for your effort. I appreciate it. Yeah, just one last thing. I just shared a newsletter in the chat. Uh, since we are about to release our issue next week, it would be good to subscribe and see what that looks like when it comes out, but also just to keep uh, up to date on what we do. So we encourage you to subscribe to that. And this recording will be available uh, on our YouTube channel. Is that right, Adriana? I think for now, we're just planning to save it in our drive. So if you do want a copy, I can send it to you. Uh, we can send the slides. Actually, I'll probably, I'll probably send the slides out after this, too, in case you, you want to review. Well, thanks, anyone, everyone. And th uh, feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.